Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. The part that resonated the most came just before the 8-minute mark of Jury No. 8's 38-minute edited interview with East Idaho news legend Nate Eaton. Nate asks Saul Hernandez what he thought about a fight and, uh, you know, Laurie and Chad had a fight over texts and what he thought about that. And this was his response. Those encounters. That blew my mind. That blew my mind because when you think about, uh, I can see a teenager, you know, a, a, a kid being so impressionable that they may fall for something like that. But when you think about an adult that has li- lived a lifetime, um, and, 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 and he is telling her that she has no protection, and, and then she acknowledges it. And he goes to the point of saying, you need to give me a thumbs up emoji. I, that, that blew my mind. I couldn't comprehend how that even made sense for her to be like, okay. At one point in August of 2019, the two of them got into an argument where Lori Vella ends up ignoring Chad Daybell's messages to her. He begins texting her multiple times. And he says something like, the, the angels are angry, you are ignoring me. I'm not trying to manipulate you to respond. I understand you need your space, but the protection I built around your house is gone. She later responds, I love you. And then she writes back, I love you. And he says, okay, I'm going to restore all your powers. It's something like, like that. Yes, yeah, something along. So what the juror is getting at here that is so true and so apt is Laurie's emotional immaturity. It's so immature that it's crazy. Not only Laurie's, but Chad's as well. During my travels, right now I'm in Hurricane Utah. I'll be in Salt Lake City uh, this time tomorrow. I've been hiking around, I've been driving around. While I've been traveling, it's occurred to me that just about every high-profile case I've written about deals with someone falling in love or someone who is in love and then acting very naively within that framework. And of course, it's when we're in love, I mean, this applies to us as well. When we're in love, when anyone is in love, we're at our most vulnerable and unrealistic. We're also the most susceptible to manipulation, to uh, flights of fancy, right? Juror number eight also said what we all felt when he described his disgust, Laurie and Chad honeymooning in the midst of three, four murders and two of her children buried in Chad's backyard. Yeah, I think um, disgusted was... Is the best word I can give you. I, I was disgusted. Um, I think it's one thing to do what they've done, but to that point, to move on so quickly from a 20 plus year of marriage, um, two kids on the ground, and, and, and then you look at the evidence and how it was planned out with buying rings, buying dresses prior to booking flights, I don't know. It's just um, disgusting. Well, that is the best word, isn't it? Now, personally, my first impression, my my very first impression of juror number eight in court wasn't that great. And so I was pleasantly surprised to hear him speak and see just how eloquent and balanced he is in his interview with Nate. For example, he describes Laurie when the autopsy photos were shown in court trying to disappear, wanting to hide away in court. I thought some of those descriptions were were really very eloquent and and very true. Although he does reveal that he had some reservations, uh, um, you know, that he admits that he was holding out a little regarding Tylee's murder and needed some convincing from his fellow jurors. And I, and I, I disagreed with him on one other point, Overall, I thought he came across as a real asset to the jury pool, and we're going to get to that. So before we get to, I've sort of put together about eight observations 
in terms of the jury, bear in mind, I spent a couple of weeks in Boise. I was in court for a, a number of days. I was observing the jury as well, tweeted about them as well. Uh, before I get to that, if you haven't subscribed to this channel, please do. Uh, if you're enjoying this episode, this coverage, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. So I'm going to go through eight basic observations and they're sort of all over the place. Um, some are smallish little quibbles and others are sort of bigger, bigger issues. So the first one is chewing gum. As I mentioned earlier, my first impression of juror number eight wasn't that great. I thought he was chewing gum and I tweeted that as well, right? Um, perhaps I was mistaken, maybe he wasn't chewing gum. And if I was mistaken, I apologize. But personally, just my own opinion, I personally don't think it's terribly respectful to be chewing gum in court, let alone as a juror. You might say, um, boo to you, you know, whatever, whatever. Well, in court, you, you, you're not even allowed to wear a cap. Um, also, if you're typing on your keyboard too loudly, an orderly would come up to you and, and ask you to kind of be more respectful, be less of a distraction. So I don't know what you guys think about chewing gum, but that is something that I noticed. Number two, no rules about notebooks. So I also noticed in the beginning other jurors had notebooks and a little while later juror number eight had one too. Although there are no rules about notebooks, I personally think it's a good way to stay engaged and keep track of what's going on. So on April 20th, I tweeted, virtually every juror has a notebook. And I suppose I could have said the word now. And then I said, nice. So there was, I think, a sort of a, um, a trend, or, you know, there was a, in the beginning, not too many had notebooks. I think when they realized just how vast the archive of this case was, more and more decided, okay, I think I'm going to need to take notes, right? Number three, jury number eight admits he got confused re the, uh, re regarding the timeline. This is a confusing case. This is one of the more compli complicated and confusing cases that, that are out there. And, and I think it, for that reason, um, it's not maybe as high profile as I think it deserves to be. The timeline is definitely confusing. You know, in most murders, including multiple murders, they tend to happen on the same day. They, se they tend to be committed by the same person. In this case, you have around four different dates multiple crime scenes and you know in at least two of the murders you sort of had even the police not being sure or taking Laurie Laurie's word for what happened and so um, it, it only came afterwards like a boomerang oh okay so maybe that was a murder right in this case you besides these four different dates you've got multiple burial plots multiple suspects multiple crime scenes so it is confusing, which is why you might want to take notes. But this is also why the prosecution need to put some of the pertinent information kind of on display and repeatedly put it there for, uh, you know, for example, the timeline to reinforce it so that the jurors are clear about that sort of thing. And I think that's something that they should do in all cases. Be very clear about the timeline because that's one of the pillars in terms of a prosecution. Number four, number eight didn't look at Melanie Gibb while she testified. I was looking for a tweet that I may have posted, maybe I didn't post it, because one thing I noticed with juror number eight that worried me early on was right in the beginning when Melanie Gibb testified, just very early on in the trial, he didn't seem to be looking at her. So, so she was essentially almost right next to him. And he didn't seem to be looking at her or listening to her. He, my impression was that he was chewing gum and, and sometimes even looking at the ceiling. To me, he seemed bored. And, and I remember thinking, I've got a bad feeling about this. And I know perhaps you don't want to hear that. Perhaps you think, jeepers, whatever, <laughs> you know. But Melanie Gibb was one of the few people close to Laurie who testified at some length about Laurie. That brings us us to the fifth point um, he describes Colby and Summer's testimony as powerful 
Well, I thought so too. So I really agreed with him on that point. Number six, two jurors needed convincing that Laurie was responsible for Tammy's death as well. So to his credit, I don't think he was one of them. But if you think about it, of the four murders, Charles and JJ's murders were the hardest for Laurie to offer an innocent explanation. I mean, you have the insurance stuff in terms of Charles and the text about casting spells and demons and and demons with particular names. That's all to do with Charles. And then you've also got the body cam. So you've got her at the scene. You've got her smiling and, you know, and... and, um, and then with JJ, we know where JJ was and, and how, you know, where he was and, 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 and who was with him and the time that all of this is going on. And we know how Laurie felt about him being out of control right up to the moment when he disappears. But Tammy and Tylee have less, a lot less certainty about them. Jury number eight seemed to need no convincing that Laurie had a hand in Tammy's death, but curiously, he needed some convincing when it came to Tylee's murder. And so that brings us then to point number seven. Is this a crack in the prosecution's case? Did you know that jury number eight was, for a certain period, the sole holdout, the, the kind of the only holdout, if I'm understanding him correctly, in finding Laurie guilty of conspiring to murder Tylee? He seemed to be the only one of the 12 basically saying, I, 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 don't, I, I don't see it. Now, if you think about it, Tylee's murder is a lot harder to figure out. Um, I want to say it was me and another juror that had questions about it at first. And then through evidence and discussion, this other ind- individual I think got behind you know, the, the, the group, and I wanted to hear more. I just felt like Tylee's murder one charge hadn't been proven beyond reasonable doubt for me yet. And perhaps it was that I, I didn't remember or, or I didn't have all the evidence that I wanted to see. And respectfully, and my, my, my fellow jurors did a great job you know, they, 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 we talked, they presented, we pulled some exhibits, we went through them all, we listened to some more audio, and that helped me come to the conclusion of guilty. You know, it, it, it's, it's a big charge, and I really wanted to give it its process, its due process that it required. So that audio is obviously from... East Idaho News from Nate Eaton's great uh, interview with him. So, you know, if you think about Tylee's murder, it is a lot harder to figure out when isn't very clear. With Charles Vello, when is very clear. With Tammy, when is is pretty clear. With uh, JJ, when is fairly clear. With Tylee, it's, it's not that clear. How she died isn't clear either because her remains were destroyed. And I suppose one might imagine something nasty, nastier than was in fact the case, could have happened with Alex Cox entirely. But the reality is many of the same symptoms in JJ's murder were present in Tylee's. For example, Laurie gave an explanation to David Warwick and Melanie. I, I believe it was that Tylee was at BYU you know, in, in, to explain why she wasn't around. And so... Laurie said, well, Tylee's at BYU and and wanted to be independent. We also know that Tylee and Melanie didn't really get along. Um, There was sort of like a real animus between the two. Um, Anyway, at one point, Laurie complained that Tylee was behaving oddly because she cleaned her room and is being nice. And this is the exact text that Laurie sent to Chad. She said, meaning referring to Tylee, she's being super sweet and helpful and she cleaned her room. She is switched, totally not her. See if she got switched. And in other words, she wants Chad to check, to check her rating. You know, is she, is she at zero? Is she basically taken over completely? Is she a zombie? You know, should, and I guess should she die? 
And then Chair Ch- Daybell takes her back that she was switched. This is how sick it is. If Tylee misbehaves or acts out, she's evil or possessed. If she's sweet and good, then she must be evil as well because it just can't be her. But the point is, no matter what Tylee does, she's in the way of an orchestrated plan. And the same plan was orchestrated in broadly the same way for each of the four victims. So although there may be less evidence in terms of Tylee's murder than any of the other victims, it follows the same pattern fairly closely. But this was a possible crack in the prosecution's case, and perhaps this was Laurie's best chance for a hung jury. Can you imagine if the juror held out, this particular juror held out on that? Anyway, fortunately, that didn't happen. And that brings us to the eighth and final point, um, and I disagreed with the juror on this point. I can't find the exact moment the jury's asked if he thinks Laurie really believed the mumbo-jumbo stuff. Uh, I've kind of gone through the interview forwards and backwards so many times, I just cannot find that exact moment. I did hear it on the first listen through. But he said something like, it's not quite as simple as that, but in some, he felt that she did believe it. In any event, this is where I found myself disagreeing with him. And it's not like I totally disagree with him because I think there is an aspect where she did believe, she did initially believe um, certain things. So it is a difficult question because think about it, Laurie grew up in a religious household and and I think these the this, this sort of cult thing was built on top of that. And so when there's a sense that something has and something did take root there within that thing of the beliefs that she really had once upon a time. But it's hard to believe someone who was predicting the end of the world would prepare, prepare for it like, you know, sitting next to a pool. And you would imagine if the money they were getting for God's work, if that's what it was truly for, well, where are the bags of rice? Where where are the tents? Where are the first aid kits? Instead, there are just flights, hotels, and sexcapades, and I guess a lot of weapons that were bought. That suggests to me someone who got caught up in her own pageantry, her own hubris, and doomsday was simply the flavor of the month that people seemed to be buying and that Chad was selling a few people on. And Laurie realized this. Laurie saw this. And so in conclusion, I said before the case, before the case went to trial that I always felt Laurie was the mastermind. She was the one pulling the strings, and the jury agreed that that was the case. I like that he described her as an alpha, as a leader, because that's exactly what she was. He also described Chad as someone who was happy to play second fiddle as long as he was getting his fix. Laurie used Chad's system to further herself. I don't think that means she believed in the nonsense, just that she believed the nonsense could be used to get Laurie where Laurie needed to go. Does that make sense? The crazy part is that others did believe it. At least one person did believe in the nonsense, it seems, and that was Alex Cox, hook, line, and sinker. And a few others did too, maybe not hook, line, and sinker, but some like Zolima and arguably Melanie Gibb, they were hooked or partially hooked for some of the time. The silence around, you know, if you think about the silence that surrounded Laurie before, during, and after, you know, the, the kid's disappearance, so after Charles's death, during the, the disappearance of the children, that was kind of deafening. You know, there was a period where Melanie Gibb could have come forward and she didn't. But there, were, there was a period where other people could have and should have come forward and they didn't. Were her parents ever in court? Did we hear much from her family members besides recordings made in the past? So, you know, Laurie's been convicted and sentenced. And there is going to be another trial, and she's now also been implicated in the attempted murder of uh, Brandon uh, Boudreaux, right? So that's a kind of a separate issue. Think about the silence that you sort of get. You get the feeling that Laurie was counting on um, on a lot of people keeping their silence. And wasn't Laurie counting on that to get away with the abominable? And if you think about that craven silence, that default setting, what do you think that silence is trying to cover? I mean, beyond 
Laurie, the people that are out there that, that have never really spoken about this, what do you think that silence is trying to cover? Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you. David Boone's mom is very important to me, and a good wife, and a good worker, and being all those things together is not easy. So I'm basically a ticking time bomb. <laughs>